When parents treat a child like they're worthless and tell them that they're no good, it can plant that evil self-sabotaging seed in them that even if you fight it and you rebel, it can drag you down. Sometimes it strikes you all at once. Sometimes that self-sabotage comes and gets you in a hundred little decisions that you make. And it can go on for so long and get so entwined in the way you live, in what you imagine is possible in your life, that it can be hard to see that you forgot who you are. You forgot who you were meant to be. My letter today is from a woman I'll call Margie, and she writes, Hey Anna, I grew up in a home with two sisters, one a year older, one a year and a half younger, and the classic alcoholic father, anxious codependent mother dynamic. All right. I have a pencil. It's not the fairy pencil today. I lost it on my trip to Arizona last week. I'm getting another one, but for now it's just a pencil. All right. As a kid, Margie says, we, we had the money to go on vacations, but we never did. My mother always voiced her disdain for wanting to go anywhere. She didn't have to with my father, even if it meant we didn't go as a result. We went to a Catholic elementary school, and I distinctly remember never having clean, pressed clothes or even my hair kept. I feel like my mother's focus was always on either my father, herself, or survival. My sisters and I remember hearing her say, stay up late after we had gone to bed, waiting for my drunk father to walk in the, through the back door, and then she'd start crying about how he didn't care about anyone but himself or, or something along those lines. You could tell he didn't give an F, and she would do this on a, on a weekly basis waiting for him to come home from a night out partying to tell him how badly he was treating her only for him to act cold and uninterested. This is the kind of thing that sets up a pattern. All right, during this time as a young child, I do recall fantasizing a lot. I would go out in the alley on my bicycle and ride up and down the length of it, dreaming of a make-believe person who I was supposed to be and what type of life that person had. And this continued through my teen years and through the very early parts of my early, early 20s. And I always imagined myself as a woman who had far more capabilities. And I should mention, wait, I'm going to circle that. I circle things on the first reading just so I can see the gist of it. And then I'll come back and talk about what I've been noticing in this letter. So Margie says, I should mention that through my childhood, my father berated my sisters and me, mostly older sisters and my older sister and me, by calling us stupid, foolish, no smarter than N-words. My mother never told me I was pretty. Out of my three sisters, I was the one who never heard this compliment. She would say that she never gave it because she didn't want me to get a big head and turned out to be stuck on myself. Oh, dear. By the time I got to be 18 years old, I got into stripping and doing private parties, bachelor parties, divorce parties, golf outings, etc. And before long, I got introduced into the world of being an escort, a call girl, if you will. And she says, I met my daughter's father through this way of work, and we'll call him Armand. Armand has pretty much always been soft, kind, and patient and forgiving with me. I didn't intend to start a family with him. At first, I figured I could parlay this into a sugar daddy thing so I could get away from the late nights and having to sleep with so many different men for money all the time. But as time went on, his kind nature grew on me and it developed into an actual romantic relationship. And it's important that I add one of the major things he kept from me during this time was how he made his money. He was into some sort of identity theft slash fraud and was in the United States illegally. He also had a toddler son back in his home country who he stopped flying over here. It turns out he was never honest with the son's mother about our romantic involvement and didn't want her to find out, so he was avoiding having them here altogether. I never expressed my disdain or discomfort for any of this. Instead, I just told myself to pull back emotionally, and I even started to work as a call girl during that time again to get back at, at him, even though he was never made aware and I was the only one being hurt in the situation. 
Fast forward two daughters later, Arman has been locked up as of seven years ago and deported as of four years ago. And my daughters and I speak to him fairly regularly by FaceTime and the like. He sends no financial support. He's not even working and hasn't been since he touched back down in his home country three years ago. I've told him I will wait for him to return because I feel I owe it to my kids. I also feel like no one will ever love me the way he did. He stood by me through serious ailments. I have ulcerative colitis and lost all my hair once. I've been hospitalized many times, and he knows about my past but still accepts me as lovable and beautiful. I know I'm selling myself short here, and I want to not do that anymore. More than anything, I want true love with someone who I'm not trying to manipulate in the beginning. I want the vulnerable. I feel like I never was with that. I was never vulnerable with Armand. I fear because I'm 37 years old, two kids with my history. It's such a faint possibility. I desperately want companionship and ultimately marriage. I know this is getting long, but something very important to add. I have a sugar daddy now. I've had this one who I'll call Mark. And uh, since seven years ago, when my kid's father first got arrested and incarcerated, I only work part time as a retail associate, and I've never made much money outside of using sex in exchange for it. I feel like without Mark providing me a monthly allowance or income, I would never be able to survive on my own. I enjoy working part time as it allows so much time for my kids and me together. Plus, I get overwhelmed so easily, and I feel a full-time schedule would do just that. I was recently incorrectly diagnosed with ADHD, I believe, she says. I would love your insight to this matter, Anna. I've found myself in limerence with a crush um, on a guy at work, and it's making me miserable. I want the real deal. I don't want to go on living like this. I know I should have much more. I just need the steps to get there. Please, I'm ready to do the work. And she says, thank you, sincerely, Margie. Oh, gosh. All right. I think I can help. Um, I had, There was a lot to circle here. And <sighs> Margie, I'm so sorry about the way that you were raised. I can just see it. You know, when you were describing your parents, I read your letter first, you know, one time through. And when I read it again, preparing to record this response to your letter, I was just like, oh, my gosh, look at that what your parents said to you, like, not just that you weren't pretty, and I, you know, I know that that's an important validation we get, but also that that thing about your mom hanging out every week, sort of going into some, I don't know, borderline reaction or something where she just, she wanted to wait for your drunk dad, or she just couldn't put it down. Like, that's what he did. He would go out and drink and come home drunk, and she would wait for him to get into the big fight with him about it. And that was her emotional outlet. And it's so sad. And I'm really glad, like, you're not in that kind of a situation right now. That's something, right? But also, this thing that they said to you where they, that your dad said you were stupid, foolish, and no smarter than N words. Unbelievable. That is, like, that's, I just, I can't help but feel it, Margie, that somehow that got inside and a little bit you're thinking that too about yourself. And that's why you think you can't have like an ordinary life. You know, there's a lot of, I was a single mom for nine years with two kids. And um, so, you know, I'll just be a role model for you. You can put your life back together. And I totally get it that with your past, it's a thing and not everybody can accept it. But that doesn't mean that this guy who's in another country not sending money, that's not the best you can do. You didn't mean to start a family. It turned into an actual romantic relationship. You didn't know what he did. And that's kind of like, that's kind of what a person with complex PTSD, that's what we do. We stay fuzzy because instinctively we kind of know, like, if I know that, I can't really stay in good conscience. Like, that's not good. And of course that affects your daughters. I'm just here, you know, I'm not here to scold you about it, but I'm just here to validate, like, it's not good that they are so separated from, from their dad. It's not good that what's going on in your life, in your energy, in your self-concept is this belief that you have to have sex for money in order to survive. I don't believe that's true. And I know it's hard, like, especially if that's what you used to do. Now, there's this whole culture out there. I've heard it all my life, really, because I, where I live in Northern California, everybody tries to be so cool about everything, but they call it sex work. And they go, oh, it's like empowered, it's a choice, and it's not. There's almost always sexual abuse. There's almost always a history of abuse. And 
when there's prostitution or pornography, I'm going to come out and say it. It's harmful to all parties and it wouldn't exist unless people had been abused and damaged by sexual abuse. And there it is. Uh, it does terrible damage to people who consume it. And um, when I was dating, I could tell, I could tell a man who had been using a lot of porn. And I knew people who visited prostitutes as well. And they're just like their whole energy was so messed up until they really healed from what happened. You know, once it's done harm to your life, I don't think there's a 50-50 solution. Like there needs to be like a massive change where it is renounced, that it's renounced and you do the work to recover the sovereignty of, of your own being and your self-sufficiency that you do not need a sugar daddy. And I know that throughout history, you know, lots of people have had to do this. Lots of people have had to do it to get through rough times. But what you're doing right now is you're doing it in all times. And so you are 37. This is a beautiful age to give yourself the time to go into personal development time, right? And especially for your daughters. This is not a, something you want to pass on to them. It would do them so much good to witness what a woman looks like when she's getting free, when she's getting up on her feet, when she's learning how to earn her paycheck, even if it means you guys are all living in a one bedroom apartment, the dignity of being able to earn your own money and only have sex with somebody for reasons of love and commitment is going to be such a wonderful thing to demonstrate to them. And it can transform to this situation faster than you think. And I know you wrote to me and I know you wanted to hear what I had to say, but I, I just really urge you to put this down, just renounce it. And you have the part-time sales job. And I know that you need that time with your daughter, but you need development. Like retail sales is a notoriously difficult way to make money. I've been talking about money a lot. For people who were traumatized and want to change their life, like getting stuck in a minimum wage job, it's a very difficult road. There's dignity in it, but for progress in your life and especially for raising children, it's time for you to get your education. And I really, really, I don't even know, I think you're in the United States. In the United States, in your state, there are programs that help single moms to make these changes that provide some support. I know it's never enough. I know it's really difficult. I know it takes a lot of energy, but you can begin to, you know, pave your path to start walking out of this trap that you're in of being stuck, unable to get your own money and to be free of men who exploit you. All right. So you said, I don't want to keep living like this. I know I should have much more and you should, you deserve so much more. You deserve to breathe free air, to have that freedom and to feel wonderful about yourself for your accomplishments, for your intellect, for your grit and your courage for being able to change your life as you have. It's not your fault that you were abused when you were a kid. It's not your fault how it affected you and how that sort of took place. But now you're the only person who can start to walk yourself out of it. I'm going to encourage you to get involved in a 12 step program. And one program where there are women who have been involved in sex work is Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. And there are women's meetings where you can have friendship and fellowship with women who get it, who are supportive and accepting of you. And you can begin to work a free program. I'm really a fan of free, free things. It needs to be free, right? So free help to begin to start changing your life and to identify and change the self-defeating behaviors. Because it's not just that top level of what's going on of how you get your money. There's stuff underneath that about how you feel about yourself, things that need to be rooted out. And the 12-step programs are very powerful for that. If you, if you take them seriously, you go to a meeting, don't get, don't ever use meetings for dating. That's called like pooping in the, what is it? I don't know. It's a metaphor for don't mess it up. Don't mess up this sacred space where you're doing your healing and you need to trust people and be safe. And the other thing that you can do for free is my daily practice. And I, these, these are the techniques that I had so much self-hatred and difficulty and feeling like I can't do it. I can't change. And the daily practice just day by day has helped me just take a little layer off, take a little layer off, take a little layer off and start to become my full and real and empowered self. That is a free course. It's down below in the description section under every video I make. Now for people watching this, if you have a self-defeating behavior that you feel like you need to get to, I have a worksheet for you. You can download it for free. You can click on that right here and I will see you very soon.